James 19 contains God's words to Sennacherib, who is the king of Assyria. Let's look at just briefly at the setting before we read the verses. Sennacherib and his Assyrian army is coming against Judah. All the nations before have fallen to them, and the little nation of Judah doesn't have a chance. He uh, is diverted briefly from his campaign, but he sends a letter to Hezekiah. And the letter basically says, give up. You don't have a chance. Where are the gods of all the other nations? Don't rely on your God. And Hezekiah takes that letter into the house of God, spreads it before God, and he prays. In verse 19, we have the end of that prayer. Now, therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. And through Isaiah, God sends a message to Hezekiah. Look at verse 20. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. And now what we have is God's words basically to Sennacherib. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers you have reproached the Lord and said, By the multitude of my chariots I have come up to the heights of the mountains, to the limits of Lebanon. And I will cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypress trees. I will enter the extremity of its borders to its fruitful forest. I have dug and drunk strange water, and with the soles of my feet I have dried up all the brooks of defense. Did you not hear long ago how I made it, from ancient times that I formed it? Now I have brought it to pass that you should be for crushing fortified cities into heaps of ruins. Therefore their inhabitants had little power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and the green herb, as the grass on the housetops and grain blighted before it's grown. But I know your dwelling place. You're going out and you're coming in and your rage against me. Because your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my ears, therefore I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you came. Sennacherib made four big mistakes which led to his downfall. I want to talk about those four mistakes as they're found right here in this passage and warn us that we not make some of the same mistakes that Sennacherib made. His first big mistake was he reproached God. And the way by which he reproached God was he tried to equate the God of Israel with all of the false gods of all the other nations. Look again at verse 22. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high against the Holy One of Israel? I'm not going to turn to it, but in Isaiah 44, there is discussed the fact that a person can take a tree and he he cuts down that tree. He takes some of it and he makes a fire and he warms himself. And he takes uh, another part of that tree and he makes a fire and he cooks his food on it and then he takes another part of the tree and shapes it up and forms it and makes a god out of it and bows down and worships his god and then another passage talked about they'll paint lips on it but the mouth can't speak and they'll paint eyes on it but the eyes can't see 
had ears on it, but the ears can't hear. And they have to make sure it's real uh, solid on the bottom so it won't fall over. Can you imagine falling down before a God that's made out of the same tree that you've warmed yourself by and that uh, you cooked your food on and call that your God? And Sennacherib thinks that the God of Israel is like that guy, that God, and does not recognize, no, the God of Israel is not to be equated with the gods of the heathen. That the God of Israel is the living God, the Holy One of Israel, the one who can hear and read and see, the one who made the universe and everything in it, and the one who can save any nation, large or small, from the nation of Assyria. But let me tell you something. We don't have to be a king to reproach God. There are any number of ways that we may reproach God. One of those ways is is to use his name carelessly. It is so sad to me that probably the most common way of expressing excitement or fear or whatever is to use the name of God as in, oh my God. Do people have no respect for God? And many people, it's become so common they don't even know what they're doing. Charlotte was telling about one time getting her hair fixed. There was nobody else in the business, and it was just she and the lady who was doing her hair, and the lady was a Christian, and twice she used God's name in that very form. And when it was finished, she said, you know, I wish you wouldn't use God's name as you do. She said, what did I do? Charlotte said, twice tonight. You said, oh, my God. And the woman broke out in tears. And she said, I had no idea I used that expression. She had used it so commonly that she didn't even realize she had used it. Charlotte and I were in a restaurant one time, and right in the next booth, there was some woman talking loud, loud enough to hear all over the restaurant, and over and over and over she used that. And I began to heat up, and Charlotte could see that I was, and she said, now, Bill, there's no use saying anything about it because it, and I think to this day I should have said something to that woman about that. We don't use God's name like that. And when we do, you can be sure we're reproaching God, the God of heaven. And neither do you use OMG when you use your social media. That's the same thing. Nothing that would show a disrespect for the God of heaven. There's another way we repose God. And that is somehow thinking that we know more about what pleases God than God does. There are people everywhere and they're just doing all kinds of things in religion that are not found in the scriptures. And you go talk to them and they say, but I know God would be pleased with what I'm doing. No, you don't know anything about God except what God revealed to you. And I remind you of Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. God doesn't think as we think. He doesn't do things as we do. And consequently, we cannot in our own minds know what is going to please God. A simple illustration of that. Suppose there's somebody in Gardendale and he has uh, been a major benefactor of the, of the city of Gardendale and you decide, well, we're going to have a day in special honor of this man. And so there's a little uh, committee that's appointed and they go see the man and say, we're going to have a day in your honor. We'd like to know if there's something you'd like for us to do on that day. And he thinks about it, and he said, well, okay, come back tomorrow, and I'll, I'll have some things. And so he writes down some things that he wants done that day in his honor. 
when the day comes, we pay no attention to what he says. We just do what we would enjoy doing, what would uh, lift us up emotionally. Do you think that would honor the man that we supposedly have come together to honor? It wouldn't honor him. In a sense, it would reproach him because it would show an absolute disrespect for the man. And so it is when we think somehow that we can do something that suits us with no consideration of what God has said in his word. There are many ways in which we can reproach God. And Sennacherib was brought down because he reproached the living God. Here's a second mistake. He failed to realize that God is the one who gave him the success that he had enjoyed. The following words are the words of Sennacherib. Verse 23, by your messengers you have reproached the Lord and said, here's what they've said, by the multitude of my chariots I have come up to the height of the mountains, to the limits of Lebanon. I will cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypress trees. I will enter the extremity of its borders to its fruitful forest. I have dug and drunk strange water. And with the soles of my feet, I have dried up all the brooks of defense. Look what I have done, said that group says. Listen to God's answer. Did you not hear long ago how I made it? From ancient times that I formed it? Now I have brought it to pass that you should be for crushing fortified cities into heaps of ruins. Therefore their inhabitants had little power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and the green herb, as the grass of the house tops and grain blighted before it is grown. No, it wasn't you, Sennacherib. I gave you the power to do that. I gave you the success that you had. You know what it reminds me of. We won't turn over there. But you remember when Nebuchadnezzar looked over and said, This is great Babylon that I have built with my mind and my power. Nebuchadnezzar was brought down too. And it's hard to think that we could possibly be guilty of the sins of Sennacherib and Nebuchadnezzar. But let me ask you, be honest with yourself. Do we not sometimes try to take credit for that which truly God has done through us? I think someone may be a gospel preacher. When he first starts out, he's a rather humble kind of a fellow. But he gets better and better in his preaching and churches begin to learn of him and they begin to invite him for meetings. And the first thing you know, he is boasting of the great meetings that I've held and I have baptized so many people and forgets all about 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 7, who is Paul and who is Apollos. But ministers by whom you believed, I planted Apollos water, God gave the increase so then neither is he that planteth nor he that watereth, but God who gives the increase. Paul says, no, it's not us. It's God. And to God must go the glory. Or I think of someone that makes a good song leader. Someone becomes a good Bible class teacher. And they become proud. And they may think nobody else ought to lead singing. After all, I'm the best song leader, and why would we have anybody else to lead singing? And I'm the best Bible class teacher. Why should anybody else be teaching a Bible class when I'm so able to teach a Bible class? And they become proud, and they forget that everything they do is according to the grace given to them. Turn to Romans chapter 12. This, is, this expression is found many times in the scriptures. According to the grace given to me. But notice verse 6 of Romans 12. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. 
If ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. What are you able to do in the Lord's service? It's according to the grace given to you. Are you the best song leader in the Gardendale Church or wherever you may worship? Are you the best Bible class teacher? It's according to the grace that was given to you. Now observe verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Paul is warning us not to think of ourselves too highly. And he says, even my warning for you not to think of yourself too highly is according to the grace given to me. Whatever we do, it's according to the grace given to us. There's no room for boasting, for pride. And even a person who is successful in business, instead of boasting of his success in business and how wonderful I've been to make my business so strong, he fails to understand that God has blessed him and helped him to make his business what it ought to be. Whatever we accomplish, whatever success, give God the glory. Don't be like Sennacherib who boasted of his own strength. Go back to 2 Kings 19. Here's the third mistake that Sennacherib made. And he failed to realize that God was seeing and hearing all of his boasts and his threats. Those uh, first messengers who came to Jerusalem their speech was just full of vulgarity, profanity, blasphemy. Many of you, no doubt, remember some of the words that they used. And in fact, it's the kind of thing you don't even want to read in public. It, 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 they're so vulgar. God heard every word of it. And then this letter that Sennacherib would send to Hezekiah, give up it. God saw every bit of it. Turn to Psalm 2. Second Psalm, beginning with verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Can you imagine a king of the earth shaking his fist at God and saying, you're not going to rule over me? That's what Sennacherib was doing. Now look at verse 4. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Tell you what it reminded me of when my children were small. They loved to try to see if they could throw dad down. I'd spread my legs and brace myself. And one of them would jerk over here and the other jerking over here. And I'd stand there and laugh at them. Not in an ugly way, I hope. How does God picture human beings? Isaiah 40 like grasshoppers. Can you imagine one of those little kings down there, no bigger than a grasshopper, shaking his fist at God and saying, you're not going to rule over me. God looks down and laughs. And 
And that's what Sennacherib was did. It did. And God looked at him. The very idea. But this second psalm especially has to do with the kings of the earth and what they did to Christ. In fact, it's quoted. Go over to Acts chapter 4. Peter and John had been arrested. There was no charge to be brought against them. So they were threatened and turned loose and they went to their own company. Start with verse 23 of Acts 4. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God, you are made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Isn't that what we just read in the second Psalm? All right, now verse 27. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Herod and Pontius Pilate. Now turn to Luke 23. Look at verse 11. Then Herod with his men of war treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. And God saw every bit of it. And can you see Pilate cowardly Asking for a basin of water, knowing Jesus was innocent, but he calls for a basin of water and he washes himself and says, I'm innocent of the blood of this man. And God saw it all. I said a moment ago, we don't have to be rulers for us to do some of the things that some of these rulers did. We don't have to be rulers to be guilty of speech that's full of blasphemy and profanity and vulgarity. We don't have to be rulers to shake our fist at God and say, I, I'm, I'm not going to follow your word. I will not be ruled by you. Can you imagine standing before the Lord in judgment, not having repented of such? And maybe saying to yourself, maybe he didn't hear that. Maybe he didn't see that. Oh, yes. He heard it. He saw it. Back to Second Chronicles 19, um, Second Kings 19. Here's his fourth mistake. He failed to understand that God raises up rulers and God brings down rulers. Look at verse 28. Because your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my ears, therefore I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips. I will turn you back by the way which you came. Now verse 32. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come into this city, says the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. He won't come against this city, and I'll bring him down. You remember the results, don't you? 185,000 of the Assyrian army died in one night. Sennacherib went home, never again came against Jerusalem, and two of his own sons murdered him. 
Can God raise up rulers? Can he bring down rulers? Turn to the book of Daniel. I'm going to chapter 4. This is the same passage where Nebuchadnezzar made his boast of what he had done. Look at verse 31 of Daniel 4. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Who raises up rulers? The Most High does. Who brings down rulers? The Most High does. And Nebuchadnezzar needed to learn that, and Sennacherib needed to learn that, but I'm suggesting to you we all need to learn that. That it's God who brings up rulers. And that's why we ought to be very careful in what we say about those who rule our nation. Because God is the one who raises up rulers. And he's the one that can bring down rulers. You want to see another passage along that line? Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Look at verse 23. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall they st- stock, shall their stock take root in the earth when he will also blow on them and they will wither and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. All God has to do is just say, and the ruler comes. God raises up rulers to fulfill his purposes. And we don't know what those purposes are. But he is able to use them to fulfill his purposes. And then when they fulfill his purposes, he's able to bring them down. He calls uh, uh, Cyrus, the king of Persia, He calls him my shepherd. He calls Nebuchadnezzar my servant. Why is he God's shepherd, God's servant? Because God brought him out there to serve a purpose that God has. And it may be that any one ruler just fills a very small role in an overall plan of God but never question the fact God raises them and God brings them down which raises a question in our minds I guess is it possible that he has raised up our present president for some purpose and what about the one who preceded him and what about any presidents that may follow or the ruler of Russia or the ruler of China or the rulers of the, the Middle East What purposes might God have in raising those rulers up? I don't know. But we need to have faith in God to know that he is capable of raising up rulers, using them for his purposes, for what is best for his people and his cause. That's his great concern. Not any one nation. And Sennacherib didn't realize that. And he paid the cost. The downfall of Sennacherib, as pictured in 2 Kings chapter 19. Do you remember the words of Proverbs 16, 18? Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. I don't know any greater example of that than the man we have just talked about tonight, Sennacherib. But we too can become proud. We too can become so proud that our pride goes before a fall 
And let us make sure that we do not allow pride to come in our life, but to humble ourselves so that God will give grace. He gives grace to the humble. And so that God will exalt us in his own time. Let's learn the lesson. The lessons that Sennacherib needed so badly to be learned. There may, maybe, there may be somebody present tonight who um, has never humbled himself before God, never submitted himself to our Lord. Well, that opportunity is given to you every time. Well, it's always open. Anytime you have mind, anytime you have time, the opportunity is always open. But we give a special opportunity as we sing a song. Trying to encourage. Maybe, hopefully, somebody touched by the gospel of Christ. Maybe somebody who came with this purpose in mind. May come and let us know what their intent is, what their desire is. We can assist. And you can leave this building right with God. Humble before him rather than one who would resist him. Maybe we've learned the lesson from Sennacherib. Believe, be baptized, saved. It's pretty wonderful. And that's what is involved as we submit ourselves fully to the Lord and say, Lord, you teach me and I'll obey. And I've come with that in mind. As we sing... Will somebody step forward? We stand.